Today we are talking about monolithic anchors, like a single tree, rock horn, or sizable boulder, and some of the nuances around using these anchor types safely. Hi there everyone, I'm Jason. In alpine environments and environments with varied terrain, we will often make use of natural terrain features for creating a belay anchor. If we use only one connection point, we are building a monolithic anchor. The major upside of this is speed. When we are on big routes with long days, often weather and darkness are the most likely hazards. Not overbuilding anchors, when spread out across many anchors, can save a significant amount of time. The downside is obvious. We are consciously deciding to break the principle of redundancy. If this terrain feature fails, then there is no backup. So to mitigate against that lack of redundancy, we need to make sure we are selecting a good natural feature and then building a quality anchor on that feature. First, let's talk about trees. And we start by selecting a good candidate tree for our anchor. Selecting a tree trunk that is at least as thick as our thigh, a tree that is taller than us and which is alive with good roots. I like this mental model of selecting relative to our body because we are adding in more mass for the tree if we have more mass as a person. When we talk about rock features, things are similar. We want to make sure the rock is firmly attached to the mountain. We can often check this by a combination of visual inspection, pressing on and trying to move the feature, and slapping the feature and listening for a hollow echo, which would be a bad sign. We want it to have enough backside height that a small upward pull is not likely to move the anchor material up and over the feature. And to that point, having a backside overhang will help trap the anchor material in place with our downward pull. Now we need to build our anchor on the feature using all of the standard anchor building criteria like strength, timeliness, equalization, limited extension, and yes, back to redundancy as we may want to limit the number of single points of failure in the system. But we sometimes have another consideration when using natural features for anchors, and that is environmental impact. This is often most prominent with trees. Climbers will sometimes try to distribute the force around a tree by producing multiple wraps of the anchor material. For example, we can use this climbing rope to build a tensionless anchor by making four or five wraps around the tree. And the friction holds the anchor in place. We add a bite knot at the end and clip a locking carabiner to the load strand as a failsafe, but it is taking no load under normal working conditions. With robust material like a climbing rope, that will work pretty well, but we will sometimes see a similar concept using a length of cord. Let's say we wrap a cord around multiple times, then join the free ends with a robust joining knot like a double fisherman's. When we wrap the cord around multiple times to increase the surface area and distribute the load across the tree, that same surface area increase makes a bigger target for rockfall, increasing the risk that it could get cut. With this setup, the soft goods are not redundant and a cut anywhere will cause the entire system to fail. If rockfall is a concern, we can overcome this by making one less wrap and using the excess material to tie a simple bite knot master point. And speaking of master points, when we do a ponytail master point, like on this standard gear anchor, we create a shelf where we can clip in other people or materials safely as long as we have something in the master point to keep it from pulling through. But when we have a monolithic anchor, we need to note that the shelf is actually not formed by using one of each of the top strands like we would see with multiple piece placements. If we imagine we get a strand cut, what we have clipped to as the incorrect shelf fails. Instead, we need to clip strands that are to the side of the master point. Now, if a strand gets cut, our shelf stays intact. What if we are using a sling? If we are tying a master point, again, we make the sling redundant, but sometimes we might not have enough material to create that knot and may revert to a girth hitch. Now, if it's a girth hitch master point, say tied around a ring or carabiner, then it's redundant-ish. We did an entire video on circumstances when a girth hitch master point is effectively redundant and when it is not. But if we just tie a standard girth hitch, it is definitely not redundant. And so, should we make that choice, we can easily take the time to ensure that the load-bearing strand is in line with the direction of pull rather than having a sharp bend in the strand. How Not To did some testing on this, and the girth hitch with the bend resulted in a break at 25% less pull force at 12 kilonewtons, as opposed to 16 kilonewtons on a 22 kilonewton rated sling. 
Maybe you've got a weathered sling or something, and now that 12 kilonewtons is down to 6 to 8 kilonewtons. Regardless, it costs no additional material and fractions of time to simply line up the direction of pull. I use monolithic anchors a lot because I do a lot of scrambly alpine routes, but I need to know some of the limitations of those anchors and make sure I am using them appropriately. As we've discussed, there are some subtleties in doing that. Do you regularly make use of gearless terrain features? Tell us why or why not in the comments. Thanks for watching this video. Please like, subscribe, and share if you want to support us. For more information, you can go to our website at www.shortguysbetaworks.com. You can watch last week's related video on escaping the belay when we use anchors of these types, or you can check out our technical scrambling series, which gets into more of these fast rope work techniques used in terrain with lower fall forces. We'll see you next week and keep on getting more out of that big outside.